Hello. It's 10.30 on the 29th of April. My name is Jonathan Greenstein and welcome to today's webinar, FCA Authorizations, What Firms Need to Know in 2021, jointly hosted by ComplyPort and Elephants Don't Forget. Today's presentation will be delivered by two fantastic panelists, Brogan Buckley, consultant at ComplyPort, and Adrian Harvey, CEO of Elephants Don't Forget. Brogan is an experienced financial crime consultant who is skilled in financial regulation and risk. With an extensive career that has seen her working for the FCA in the authorizations team as an associate case officer, Brogan brings an unrivaled wealth of knowledge in how applications from firms are assessed to become authorized. At ComplyPort, we specialize in FCA authorizations and have successfully assisted over 1,000 financial services firms with their application to become authorized. Adrian spent the first decade of his career working in corporate banking and lending with ABN AMRO, GE Capital, and BNP Paribas. He joined the energy sector to bring commercial expertise to privatization of British gas and spent 10 years in that sector. He was managing director of the largest residential business of British gas and managing director of Aeon's property services and renewable energy business. Since March 2013, Adrian has overseen Elephants Don't Forget's steady growth. Elephants Don't Forget are world leaders in the use of artificial intelligence to augment how employees learn, retain, and evidence in-role knowledge and competency. They guarantee to increase us by utilizing the most effective learning and knowledge retention methods in combination with AI to help improve every area of their client's business. Finally, I'm joined by my co-moderator today, Philip Allen. Philip is the former director of learning at the British Bankers Association and UK Finance, and is now working as a learning consultant within financial services. Now, before we begin properly, I would like to cover a few brief housekeeping points. Either at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on how you have it configured, you will see a button called Q&A. If you have any questions, please ask them there and we'll try to get through as many as we can at the end of the discussion today. Please do not post queries into the chat function as this will not be monitored. We will also have a free giveaway, um, which will be outlining at the end of the session. Recently, it has been a turbulent time for a proportion of financial services firms. Brexit has meant that firms who are passporting into the UK now need to become directly authorized if they wish to, if they wish, to have continued access to the UK market. Firms would have needed to have registered for the temporary permissions regime, also known as the TPR, to allow them to trade post-Brexit, but before direct authorization. Regarding TPR applications, the FCA has recently said that they're expecting around 800 solo regulated firms. These would be firms that are regulated only by the FCA to apply. These firms will be issued landing slots for the application starting in July this year and running through to December 2022. But this is not all. We have seen authorizations for new payment institutions and electronic money institutions, fund management and asset management firms are all on the increase, along with a large number of authorized representatives looking to become directly authorized as well. In today's webinar, we are looking to cover what are the questions the FCA case officers are asking applicants in 2021? Why the regulator rejects authorizations? How to ensure the regulator, uh, to the regulator, senior managers are competent? And how to maintain and evidence ongoing FCA compliance? Now, before we begin, we're going to issue a quick poll, but I'm going to pass over to Philip Allen uh, to, to open this up here. Um, thanks, Jonathan. appreciate it. And welcome to the webinar, everybody. We've got lots of attendees, so please do, as Jonathan said, put your questions in the Q&A section there, and we'll try to get through them as quickly as possible. So first poll question on your screen, if you could just pop that up, Jonathan, I'm grateful, is are you looking at going through an FCA authorization? yes or no, um, in the next um, few months or the next 12 months? So are you looking at going through FCA authorizations? in the next, well, 18 months or so. If you could just pop that in there as well. Yeah. Um, welcome, Brogan, um, to the webinar. Welcome, Adrian, to the webinar um, as as well. Um, and Brogan, while people um, reflect on that, on that quick question there, are, are you seeing many more applicants, as, as Jonathan's alluded to, um, coming past your 
um, through your doors at Comply Port? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in line with the temporary permissions regime, we are um, seeing a huge increase in firms that are preparing for the first landing slot as of uh, the 1st of July. Uh, so lots of firms are preparing that application ready to submit uh, to the FCA on the 1st of July this year. Jonathan, if we could just um, conclude that poll and just post the results, it'd be quite interesting to see who we've got on that. So, 44% saying yes, and six, 56 saying no. Uh, yeah, kind of like an even split there. That, that's useful to know. We'll, we'll park that um, for the time um, being. Gives us a bit of an opportunity to know who the audience is and also um, what you're looking for in this webinar. Next slide, please. And to you, Brogan, from here. Hello everyone and again welcome. Um, so as John mentioned, I'm going to be talking about the FCA authorisation process. Um, I will also look over the current challenges that firms may face when they are applying to become authorised. Um, so I'm going to start by explaining who the FCA are. So if you can hit, click to the next slide for me. Thank you. Um, so the Financial Conduct Authority are the conduct regulator for 60,000 firms and the Prudential Supervisor for 49,000 firms. So the, as John explained, the FCA are expecting to take on many more authorizations in the next year or so, um, including the international firms currently registered under the temporary permissions regime. So, as John mentioned again, around 1,500 firms entered the temporary permissions regime and the FCA are expecting to regulate around 800 of these. These firms must be authorised by the end of December next year. The FCA will also be taking over the regulation of prepaid funeral provi providers and intermediaries who will also be authorised with the FCA by July 2022. Next slide, please. Thank you. So firms that are authorised by the FCA can carry out regulated activities subject to their scope of permission in the UK. So if you carry out a regulated activity in the UK without authorisation, you may fa face a fine, um, unlimited fine and two years imprisonment. An authorised firm must um, comply with uh, strict rules set out by the FCA in relation to its business and relevant staff must also meet the threshold conditions at all times. So these include the location of offices. So essentially a firm must be a registered body corporate under UK law. The firm's mind and management, for example, directors, compliance functions, audit functions should be based in the UK. The firm must be capable of being effectively supervised by the FCA. So this could be affected depending on the complexity of the firm's regulated activities, the products that it offers and how the business is organised. But in most cases, a firm needs to be based in the UK to be able to be effectively supervised by the FCA. Um, but this is considered on a case by case basis. The firm must be able to demonstrate that it has appropriate resources, that's both financial and non-financial. So an example of non-financial would be the requirement of having knowledgeable and competent staff. The firm must also be able to demonstrate that its affairs are conducted in an appropriate manner and they must also evidence the ongoing competency and ability of its management staff. And lastly, the firm's approach to doing business must be suitable for its regulated activities and it must also have regards to the FCA's operational objectives. So with regards to who requires authorisation, essentially any firm that is carrying out a regulated activity in the UK by way of business must be authorised by the FCA unless it is exempt. Now all three terms are defined in the FCA's handbook. Some firms that require authorisation will include financial services firms, so these are your banks, credit unions and insurance firms, consumer credit firms such as credit brokers and lenders, investment firms such as wealth fund and asset managers and corporate finance firms, and payment services firms such as e-money firms like PayPal. So as mentioned previously, the FCA are also in onboarding international firms and funeral plan providers and intermediaries. I've outlined in the next few slides an overview of the steps to authorisation. So if you're looking to become authorised, the process will look something like this. However, this process does vary for every firm type. So the very first step would be to register with the company's house and set up a bank account. 
register in with Companies House costs around £12 and it ensures that you are a UK known establishment by HMRC. You would then need to seek outside consultant advice if required. Um, so this can assist with the application process and it may include compliance, accounting and legal support. Firms will be required to use the FCA's Connect system to complete or upload their application for authorisation. This process will vary depending on the firm type. The firm will then need to prepare documentation which will be attached to the online application. So the documentation that looks to support the application uh, would be information such as a business plan, a compliance manual, a compliance monitoring program, CVs for the appropriate individuals and then organisation and controller structure charts. Firms will also be required to submit financial information to the FCA um, to support the application. So information that firms may need to include um, but is not limited to our three year financial projections. So that would be a balance sheet, a profit and loss and a capital adequacy, an ICAP and an ILAB if necessary, current annual accounts if applicable and controller financials for both corporate and personal controllers. The firm will also need to consider the required capital resource requirement and how they aim to achieve this. The next step would be for the firm to complete the FCA's application itself. Now, this will either be completed on the Connect system or it will be downloaded, completed and then uploaded at a later stage. The application process will consist of, but is not limited to, an authorisation form. Um, so that will be an authorisation or a MIFID authorisation form. Core details for the application, the permission profile, an IT self-assessment, a fees and levy su supplement, a MIFID annex, supporting information, disclosure of any significant events and a declaration form. There are also related applications that firms will need to submit. Um, so there will be senior management applications and controller forms. Um, so these senior management function applications are usually submitted for executive directors and partners individuals responsible for compliance and individuals responsible for overseeing money laundering. There is also a certification regime in place which applies to any employees whose role means that it is possible for them to cause significant harm. So these roles are called certification functions and firms are required to conduct an annual assessment of each certified person to confirm that they continue to meet the fitness and propriety requirements. So firms should ensure that they've established a series of ongoing key tests to help measure the fitness and propriety of relevant staff. With relation to any um, senior management and controller forms, there's lots of information that may be required, um, such as a CV, uh, statements of responsibilities, uh, criminal record checks, regulatory references, a skill gap analysis, and learning and development plan. And Brogan, um, let me just jump in there before you continue. Is that where do firms struggle with? Now, I know that depends on the size of the firm and the type of the business that they are uh, wanting to undertake in the UK. But where do you see organisations, you know, really scratching their heads and thinking, goodness me, we need outside help or, or further support on this? I think it's in relation to supporting documentation, um, it's very difficult for a firm to know where to begin. So it is not easy to draft um, a business plan or the relevant um, senior management forms um, from scratch if you have no experience. So it's very easy for a firm to trip up and the FCA needs to see that the application is thorough and complete to be able to make a decision. So um, if a document is not up to the relevant standard, that, that could detriment the decision on the application. Can I just add as well, uh, I'm sure Brogan's going to cover it in a minute, but there's also the uh, queries during the FCA's review section as well, which we um, have seen firms um, requesting quite a lot of support with. Absolutely. So once the um, application is ready um, and complete, firms need to sign the appropriate declaration forms on Connect, and they will then need to pay the non-refundable FCA application fee. So the application cannot be submitted until the uh, the fee has been processed and received successfully. 
Uh, the fees range from £100 to £25,000, depending on the firm type, the permissions required and the income derived from the regulated activities. So once the application is submitted and it's in the hands of the FCA, uh, the FCA will notify the firm when a case officer has been assigned to review the application. Um, this usually takes around three weeks um, for them to inform you of who the case officer is. And then depending on the workload, it will depend how quickly they pick this application up to review it. The case officer could ask for more information. Um, they might want clarification on a certain points or evidence to support the application. Um, if so, then they may deem the application incomplete at that stage um, and therefore that can delay a decision on the application. Now, when an application is deemed as complete, the FCA is required to make a decision within six months of receipt of the application. However, if the application is deemed incomplete and the case officer is requesting further information, they will essentially stop the clock every time they request information and start the clock again when the information is received back. This can delay the decision and in this case they are entitled to a full 12 months to make a decision on the application. Case officers do assess applications on the quality and on the quantity, so firms need to ensure that they've submitted sufficient information of a higher standard to produce a good quality application and be in for a higher chance of receiving a complete application. The FCA wants to see that firms are ready and willing to comply with the relevant regulations applicable to that firm type. Now, if the firm have not done so already, firms are required to demonstrate to the FCA that they have the adequate financial resources to meet the minimum level required. So when the FCA are happy with all the information that they have received, they will inform you of the decision. Now, if the application is successful, the FCA will write to you confirming that they have authorised the application and they will include the firm's scope of permission notice, which will state the regulated activities that have been applied for and the date in which the firm can start conducting those activities. If, however, the application is unsuccessful, the FCA can request for a firm to withdraw its application, or alternatively, if the firm do not meet the standards for authorisation, the FCA usually recommend a senior FCA committee that the application is declined and refused. Firms can appeal this decision before a final outcome is made, but if the application is rejected, the FCA will give their reasons they will refund the application fee and then firms are welcome to resubmit an application containing all relevant information at a later time. Okay, so um, thank you, Brogan. On a scale of one to five, if you could pop up the, um, the poll question, please, Johnny. Um, on a scale of one to five, how confident would you be going through an FCA authorization yourself, one being obviously not confident and five being confident on a scale of one to five, based upon what Brogan has said, how confident would you be going through an FCA authorization yourself um, there? I mean, it sounds like a daunting task, um, um, Brogan, but very simplified in what the step by step process you, you've done um, there. What are success rates um, of going through um, um, the authorization process as you are seeing it now? So it's not within the FCA's interest to decline or reject an application. So they do try, if they don't feel that an application is to a level of, of a high standard, um, they do try to work with the firm to get them to get an application approved. Um, however, we are finding recently that they are um, a lot tougher with their decisions and, and we have um, experienced some withdrawals um, in the last few months based around um, some experiences that we will explain uh, later down the presentation. Mm -hmm. Key areas of focus that you're seeing, um, has that changed um, since COVID and, and also in 2021 that they're really emphasising certain things that perhaps, you know, a year ago or two years ago pre-COVID that they weren't looking at? So definitely with relation to the senior managers, we're finding that they are very much focused on are the the individuals as well as the firm. I found a few years ago they were more focused on the firm and the culture of the firm and now it's very much developing into the firm as a whole so that includes all of the staff as well. Okay thanks. Um, Jonathan do you want to post the results up on the screen there? Okay. Um, 
Adrian, you're confident, and um, we've got uh, we've got 31 percent um, or a three um, there, which is the leading answer there. We've got followed by a four, 24 percent, and yeah, 20 percent not confident um, in that. Do you have do you have any comment on that? Um, to be honest, I'm I personally having worked in regulated markets for a couple of decades. I, I certainly wouldn't attempt it without support. Um, and, and unless, of course, you've done it multiple times yourself. So if it really was your first attempt, I, I'm not entirely sure confidence has got anything to do with it. It's more a case of it, it, it's a requirement to get it right, unless you want to go through a long and, as Brogan says, repetitively protracted process. And no real surprise. Yeah. Surprised by the results, Brogan, there? Um, um, I am, yeah. I mean, I think it's on, on the face of things sometimes. Um, if you think you know your business well, you think you'll be in quite a confident position to be able to submit a, a thorough application. But a lot of the time, it's, it's a lot to do with um, the, the documents that you supply as well. So you need to have quite a good knowledge to understand how to produce a, a good quality application. So based on our experience with authorisation, uh, we have outlined some key reoccurring questions that have been asked by case officers recently. Um, but it's really important to note that there is no set list of questions that the FCA case officer asks. Um, every application is reviewed on a case by case basis. Um, but I will run through these. So uh, the first one, please explain your understanding of the regulatory framework and the changes within the relevant sector. Uh, this can be asked if a case officer wants the firm to demonstrate its understanding of the sector that they're applying for. Um, so this is the case officer's way of assessing a firm's knowledge, experience, as well as their systems and controls. So what risks do you see on the horizon that might impact the firm's ability to adhere to its regulatory ob obligations? How do you identify new or emerging risks? And how will you ensure such emerging risks are mitigated? So this question could be asked in case of a star wants to, again, assess the firm's knowledge of the sector. Um, but they're also curious to find out how they are uh, identifying um, and mitigating current and emerging risks. So one of the um, areas that firms often trip up on, which is a very small um, error, but if there are any gaps in the employment history, these do need to be covered. So it might be a case of an individual leaving a role and starting a role five days later, but that five day gap does need to be covered. So this can take an application out of a ready status um, for that case of us to ask more questions about that gap. Um, so you don't want to trip over those very small hurdles as it may delay uh, a decision on the application. So in relation to senior management, can you demonstrate your leadership experience and have you received any training? Um, so a firm applying for authorization needs to be prepared to be able to show uh, that the individuals are ready and willing to enter the regulated market. Um, so if you're a firm applying for authorization, you really need to consider the senior management obligations as well as the overall regulatory standards set by the FCA. TRIP is a very common method used by case officers at the FCA um, and it covers the following. So trading names, have any sensitive words been used in the firm's name or the trading names? Risk flags, so these are automated uh, generated by the system and they can include an individual's history. And um, for example, if there have been any non-disclosures, criminal record convictions, um, but also internal intel uh, within the FCA on the firm or individuals. So this might be a complaint logged against the firm in the past. Um, this will be taken out of the queue and um, automatically generated as a risk flag for the case of such a review. Do the projections look realistic? Are the firm looking to grow too quickly? So the income, you need to be as accurate as possible uh, with your projections. And then the permissions, do the permissions look accurate for the firm type? And lastly, have you made known all relevant disclosures? So this question uh, might suggest that internal information has led the FCA to believe that there's information that has not been disclosed. Um, but alternatively, you might disclose the information, but the information might not be as thorough um, or as truthful as the FCA would expect. Um, and therefore, they might want you to expand on this area. But from all application submissions, 
we have received, we have learned that firms need to be as thorough, uh, as open and as honest as possible and should not withhold any information. Okay, so it is important to recognise trends uh, relating to application rejections. Um, so we've outlined some re some recent rejections uh, for your information. So uh, the FCA uh, acted to stop a Cypriot-based firm from offering high risk contracts for difference uh, to UK investors. They found that the firm was using a variety of inappropriate techniques um, and the firm also encouraged its customers to declare that they were professional investors when they didn't actually meet that criteria. So the FCA have also requested an investment firm recently to withdraw their variation application uh, due to the firm not being a profitable company, company for three years in a row. Uh, the FCA also mentioned that the CAFS policy was inadequate, but they did not expand on the reasons why. We were also informed of an application which was recently declined by the FCA for non-disclosure of a regulatory fine issued by CISEC, which is the Cypriot regulator. Um, the reasoning behind the FCA's decision was due to the firm not being open and honest with the regulator. And this is why we ex expressed the importance of not with withholding information from the FCA. Uh, and lastly, the FCA published, published a final notice in February last year um, they refused an application of a claims management company and reached the conclusion that the applicant firm was just not ready, willing and or organised enough to meet the threshold conditions, um, notably the effective supervision and the appropriate human resources. So if an application is rejected, uh, firms are welcome to resubmit an application and contain further information um, at any time. However, the previous rejections may be taken into consideration. So as mentioned previously, in line with the senior management and certification regime, a firm is required to demonstrate its staff are competent and capable. So some areas that a firm might satisfy or look to satisfy are the training and competency, the experience of their staff, and whether the person has adequate time to perform the function and to meet the responsibilities associated with that function. It is important to note that a firm may must pay attention to the maintenance of ongoing competency to its staff. So it's important to ask yourself, how is your firm ensuring that the training and competency is being monitored on an ongoing basis? Although there is a rule in the FCA handbook regarding the requirement to demonstrate its staff is competent, the FCA does not define how to assess competency. So typically the compliance and the HR team share a responsibility for defining what constitutes appropriate training and what defines competency within their firm for those certified persons. But the question is, have you documented what training and competency look like for your staff? So over the years, there have been a number of FCA fines in relation to the training of staff and staff misconduct. Um, I've outlined some of these just to explain the importance of the ongoing assessment of staff. So in 2018, uh, the FCA published a final notice of a fine to Canara Bank of £896,000 and they imposed a restriction on it accepting deposits from any new customers for 147 days. Um, this was on the basis of serious anti-money laundering failings. The FCA found that the firm's training of their sales consultants was inadequate and it did not properly equip them to give suitable advice to its consumers. In 2019, the FCA fined Carphone Warehouse £29 million on the same basis of inadequate training due to, to staff, amongst other things, the failure of anti-money laundering and financial crime training since 2012. Also in 2019, a £76 million fine was imposed against the director of the firm who was held accountable for, amongst other things, a lack of fitness and propriety. And lastly, one of the most recent fines this year was also against an individual who had been banned from working in financial services and fined £68,000 for a number of failings, including performing a controlled function without being authorised to do so 
lying about sitting exams and falsely claiming that the FCA had not yet updated the FCA register with his approved person status. So these fines are evident that in line with SMCR, seeing staff will be held accountable and it is therefore vital that they're fit to carry out their role. I think, uh, so I think it's, um, I'm going to just jump in there, Brogan, um, because I think it's really worth emphasising to um, individuals on, on this webinar that the last fine and the most recently one, and you, you'll be forgiven for not picking this up in the last two weeks that it's been launched on the FCA's website, the Simon Varley fine and, and ban, life ban as well, that due to um, a lack of being able to demonstrate um, his competency and role, i.e. his competence and therefore his exam qualifications, which he falsified or claimed to his fellow directors, that two things happened as a result of that. Not only did the regulator come down very hard on the, on the firm, but as a result, the firm could not insure itself and therefore the firm went into liquidation um, as a result. Equally, there's a responsibility of the firm, and we'll go on to this when we talk to Adrian, to make sure that the organisation has the risk controls in place and the measures and the balances and the checks to ensure that all staff are competent and fit for role, as well as obviously a duty of responsibility that the individual themselves have to make sure that they undertake appropriate qualifications and competencies in role there. And so it's worth noting that um, fitness and propriety is the responsibility of the firm as well as the individual to make sure that they present themselves. And this is more telling because Simon, in this case, was a customer facing staff claiming to um, customers and clients that he was actually regulated by the FCA, which he wasn't approved as an individual for, for over four years there. Absolutely, and it's, it's very important that um, the firms are embedding uh, competency, staff competency into the firm's culture. Um, and as, as mentioned, it needs to be an ongoing uh, basis to ensure that they're compliant with the regulatory standards. Um, but this, this slide here just defines what competency might look like. Um, and the FCA often refer to a three-tier approach of accountability and that the tone is set from the top down. Um, however, it's become very clear recently that the FCA are now focusing hev heavily on the tone from within um, and are really looking at SMCR and trying to get that ingrained into a firm's culture. So uh, next part of the presentation um, is talking about employee training and competency and um, picking up on um, Brogan's points um, there. Um, really important that organisations don't just um, say, or even individuals, um, Adrian, say, right, I've got my authorisation, I'm good to go. There's a whole lot more that you've got to do to maintain that, isn't there? That question aimed at me, Philip. Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Brogan, that was um, really interesting. Having spent a lot of time personally in in, in, in regulated spaces, I, I, I come back to my earlier point. Just why would you embark on a process that is so detailed without having a coach and mentor like your organisation? I don't know the answer. You would definitely call in the experts. Anyway, so Philip, your point. Yeah. Um, it's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? it achieving authorization, yeah, it seems to me to be a pretty challenging process. Um, but just respecting the audience, that looks like about half of the audience has already achieved that authorization. And I would suggest that, that they're probably interested in, in this in drawing down and looking at this specific aspect of employee training and competency and why it's so important. Mm. Do you want to click on, please? Who's whoever driving us loudly? Look at that. Okay. So um, our, our poll question, if the regulator came knocking at your door today, how confident would you be at evidencing competency in your firm? So if you could pop that up, Jonathan, there as a poll question there. One being that you'd obviously not be confident and five being fully confident. So if the regulator came knocking at your door today, how confident would you be at evidencing competency in your firm? And when we mean by that, uh, is that yourself as well as the as the, your staff there? Um, quite interesting to see um, um, 
certainly we've had differences of opinion when we've run webinars like this before, um, Adrian, but um, I'll be fascinated by the results. So if you could just post the results up, Jonathan, I'm conscious of time um, here, that'd be great. Um, so, okay, that's, that's, pretty, that's pretty confident. That's pretty confident. 43% um, Brogan and Adrian saying, yep, four. Four. Um, so we've got 60% of the audience saying, over 60% saying, yep, confident in that. Is that what you're seeing in the marketplace? Oh, candidly, no. <laughs> I, th I think a lot of times firm, uh, firms believe that they're competent until they're put to a bit of a test and then they realise that they're, they, there's always areas for improvement. Why is yeah. there a disconnect there? Why is there a disconnect between the firms that clearly think, well, look, 60% 60, 60 of firms saying, yes, yeah, we are, we are pretty confident in that. And what, what in reality we're seeing, why? I think it's a case of... Um, all firms are competent in certain areas, but I think certain things tend to fall behind and, and they might not see those areas as important as others. But um, the FSA sets standards for all areas of compliance and all areas should be monitored on an ongoing basis. Yeah, uh, I, I think that's an interesting observation, Brogan. And I think if you, uh, there's two points there. One is you, you, everything's great until it gets stress tested. Mm -hmm. and perhaps we see some leaks. Uh, and also, is this a holistic view or are people on the webinar looking at specific areas that they know that they have personally put a lot of effort into? For example, the competency programme for senior managers and, uh, and certified individuals. But it goes way wider than that. And we're going to cover that. So, I mean, the purpose of this is not to scaremonger. But, Philip, I remember us on a webinar a few months ago where we asked this very question and we asked a question very similar at the end. And it was like a, a 180 yeah, um, yeah. which I guess is part of the purpose of this webinar is to inform and, uh, and, and, and show firms where risk lies. So what, 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 what is the expectation, Adrian, of the regulator when it comes down to competency then? Mm. Uh, I, I, took, I, I took a quote from, 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 the, from the FCA website. It said the purpose of FMCR is to make senior managers responsible for the conduct, actions and competence of all employees. Um, under their now, now my words under their respective span of control and i want to spend some time looking at why increasingly i think it's dawning on senior managers to why this is actually a huge responsibility and the purpose of uh, uh, smcr is to make individual senior managers personally responsible and that's the theme that's going to run through this and i would ask you to hold the mirror up as on, on this call if you're listening to me dr dr droning on hold the mirror up and say well d d do we look like this or or, or do we look better mm. quick and this is this is a this is the key point here because i think that you know good and effective training and competency and we've talked about it here is an indicator of good culture within the firm yeah um so at a most basic level, I think, uh, as, a, as a senior manager, you need to be certain that the work you're delegating, not, not personally delegating, not walking over to Fred and saying, here, please do this, but by virtue of your rank and roll, it is being delegated to employees who know what they're doing. And I guess most significantly that you can prove that. Mm. But you know what, we know that um, the challenge is proving it. And if you go to the next slide, Jonathan, um, it's actually, how do they really tackle this? Yes. So, I, I mean, half, half of the delegates on, 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 on this webinar, perhaps is this, this might be new to them. Um, half of them will be going through something similar in, I, I suspect, um, as it's really the market default. So if, if you look at what happens in the market today, um, most firms are following a lowest cost of delivery model. Um, I would posit that that does not deliver against uh, what's required. Typically, this is characterised by annual refresher training. Um, in other words, an employee joins the firm, has a, a huge raft of regulatory uh, required learning to go through, and every year this is repeated same content for employees broadly. Uh, conduct rules insist that it's broken down by, uh, by, by function, but broadly the same concept. 
you know, I'll put the phrase there, death by PowerPoint, depending on what market you work in, there can be quite a considerable curriculum to go through every year, and a single point in time assessment. In other words, I've done my AML training module that lasted 42 minutes. I've taken a short-term memory test at the end of it, and um, I'm ticking a box and I can get on with my work. Um, and this is the traditional approach, certainly the approach pre-SMCR. Yes, and, and the and the challenge is there, and I've I've seen it in a in a very um, you know, in a very well known um, private bank, and the the HR director basically confessing and saying, you know what, we're onboarding our new our new staff with over fifty e learning modules within the first thirty days, <laughs> and you know what, what retention, what knowledge, what demonstration of competence will that end up in by by his um, rationale, very little. But yeah, I mean, it seems to me that SMCI, I often use this phrase, is that it, it, the, the playing field has changed. It's, it's not just a different venue. We haven't gone from Arsenal to Spurs. It's a different game. And what makes it different is the personal responsibility. And I sort of wonder whether or not that's really landed with everyone in the market. Clearly it hasn't, but it has certainly and is increasingly landing, I think, with more and more uh, senior managers. Yeah, and on the next slide, we'll know what the market actually is telling us, won't we, from compliance and risk professionals? Yeah, I mean, this is, well, we were on this together, Philip, when we, when we ran it, if I, I recall, and it was, um, it's, it's quite stark. I think if we'd asked this question before SMCR, you might have seen the opposite result, to be honest. I think that wouldn't be unreasonable to expect most firms to say that, yeah, we're, 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 we're confident. What was interesting a couple of months ago is you've got 66% um, saying they are not confident and only 10% saying they're confident. Now, I would say this, but we had a number of our own customers on that webinar, so maybe that was them. But the market per se, if I were a risk and compliance professional, following a traditional approach, I wouldn't be confident either. So... Yeah, let's drill down in and let's look at why this is happening and what the problem is with the traditional approach on the next slide, please, Jonathan. And um, why isn't a tick box approach really fit for purpose in, in, in a post SMCR? And I would argue in a post COVID environment as well. Yeah, I mean, COVID, I have a view on this and I think COVID is a, whilst it's a big impact, it's a temporary impact. But if you, if you look at why the traditional approach fails post SMCR, um, I, I, for me there there are a number of uh, number of issues. I, I would say at a fundamental level, it doesn't deliver against the regulatory requirement of ensuring that employees are competent and capable in their role. But uh, quite aside from that, and I'll go on to talk about why and evidencing that. But um, I think anyone on the call who's running a regulated firm right now, can you honestly say? Yeah, our employees love the approach that we've got at the moment. In fact, privately, would you be prepared to admit that they hate it? It's the absolute opposite. Um, they resent it um, for a number of reasons. Um, it's, it's, it's time taken. Most people realise and recognise it is what it is. It's a tick box exercise to, to, to be completed. Painful process I've got to go through to get on with my work. Um, and increasingly, this is... Uh, not what not what individuals consumers are experiencing in a marketplace where they're treated absolutely as an individual no so same consumers are employees so the you know the market's moved it's moved on a, a, a long way since i was at school and never got treated the same way now my life is entirely thank you to apple and all the other technology entirely personalized so it fails to deliver against the objective for certain um in particular it's a point that brogan referenced earlier Perhaps the hardest thing for a firm to do is to evidence evidence genuine, ongoing, in-role knowledge and competency. Uh, I can show you a point in time and we can discuss the veracity of that evidence. And I'll show you a point in time six months forward. Mm, I think this becomes opaque and, and, and really quite shaky ground. And then we look at management resentment. I mean, it, it, as, as an ex-leader in, in a regulated firm, 
every year we'd poll our employees in the annual employee engagement survey and the, the consistent poor performing area was around the investment we made in our employees to further their career and how we treated them with respect to their learning, their personal learning and development. This wasn't aimed at the exec, this was aimed at the, the, the thousands of employees, rank and file employees. And it's no wonder if you consider that approach, you know, just sit back and this is a point I made about holding the mirror up, just hold the mirror up and say, do, do you really think that doing a, a, an annual round of refresher training, one size fits all, no matter how much you polish that training, how funky you make it, yeah, is a respectful process to your employees and is going to genuinely result in a, a positive culture that the FCA is looking for. I don't, know I, I, I don't subscribe to that. And so when we, um, when we look at the interventions and the, the questions that have been posed um, by... Um, your um by elephants don't forget on the next slide please jonathan and then what we see is we see a whole different picture don't we um and it's worth reminding the audience if they don't know already that under senior managers under the senior managers regime that senior managers are required to take reasonable steps and that's to satisfy themselves that when delegating responsibilities um that they are doing it to staff who are competent now clearly this paints a different picture <laughs> from that yeah i mean philip you we know each other well and I'm, I'm i'm often accused of being straight talking uh, many other things i'm sure less polite but um I, I mean from my point of view we did 100 million interventions last year regulated firms look just like the firms are on this call today and the average level of in role employee capability and competency was 52 percent, and it's been pretty consistent for the last eight years so we fix that but the start point, 52%, and then common sense says either the other 48% isn't needed, in which case, why are you training it? Or the other 48% isn't known and is absolutely must have a detriment to the performance and culture of that organisation. And if you go further and say, and it's randomly distributed across your enterprise, it's even more worrying. Mm. Quick on, I'm just conscious of the time, guys. So, I mean, in terms of, you know, what's changed and, yeah. you know, yeah, obviously impact of COVID, whether it's, and that's a blip or whether that's, you know, uh, that continues to pervade. There are certain other seismic shifts that have happened, haven't they? Um, and you picked it up in this slide. Um, you talked about ESG, you talked about integrity and brand. And, uh, just, uh, just unpack that in a bit more detail for us. Yeah. I mean, this is a hobby horse of mine. I've, I've, I've been asked to write a blog for TC News. So if you want a copy of that, just email me. We'll get we'll we'll, we'll get you a copy. And and in it, I'm, I'm looking not in it in it, but in that blog, I am looking at um, what is going to define the decade, the twenties, and I look at the decade, the tens, and say, well, that's possibly digitalization for large firms. In the twenties, I, I I think the battlegrounds are honesty. And I think that the market's rapidly moving there. Um, honestly, honesty, integrity, and brand reputation. Um, I, I, there's never been, it's never been easier for consumers to switch. Regulators have never been more quick to punish poor performance. And it's never been easier to complain so publicly uh, on forums where the, the, the market moves against you. And you, yeah, I, 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 the reason I've shown this ESG graph is it, it's just, it's just really compelling and this of course could be a blip um, I don't subscribe to that I think that this is the start of a considerable consumer trend that positions financial services firms honesty integrity and reputation as being fundamental as those uh, to, to, to supplier decisions by consumers and yeah, we've yeah. got the combat that rules. Music has been taken by the regulator as well. I mean, talking about that finance is just not more, um, it's more societal based and therefore it's integration with society. Um, um, authentic um, finance, I think Goldman's uses the term or sustainable finance Goldman's uses is, is as well. Um, but I, I think that you're right. You've picked up that sentiment. And so is the regulator, so is the customer and firms as senior managers. You've got to pick that up, don't you? when you're representing that information and evidencing back through your authorization process. Yeah, 
I mean, the, for me, when you, you ask the question, you pose the question, what's changed? And I, I, I'm, I'm advocating that SMCR is, it has caused the market to question previous practices, particularly about employee competence, training and competence. Um, conduct rules, I think, will be really interesting because I think this is the regulator saying, not only have I established a precedent for holding senior managers personally accountable for their failings of the troops on their watch, um, I, I am now going further and saying this is what I expect your employees to know and understand how that impacts their role. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> and so um, if we move on to the next slide after that, thanks, Johnny. Um, so how are senior managers, you know, um, looking and reviewing and, and able to assess training competency within their firm? So I'm just imagining people on this um, webinar say, well, what's the how to then? Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think in the past, it might have been acceptable for a senior manager pre SMCR to point to the L&D function and say, you know, this is this is their responsibility. Now, whilst it is perhaps L&D's function to train employees in the organisation, it is not L&D's responsibility to ensure these people are competent. It is your personal responsibility. Yeah. And that, for me, is the seismic shift. It is no longer acceptable to delegate the responsibility. In fact, the regulator ensures that you cannot, by putting your name in that box, as the person, the single person responsible for that outcome. So I think it's been, I think a game changer. Yeah. And... And I think that when you've, you've pictorially represented it here and you've given a, a few options and, and choices um, there, but you've seen that seismic shift and that seismic shift really can only be um, reflected in the, the, the expectations of the regulators can only be reflected by using technology. It really can't be done manually nowadays, can it? I, I, I don't think so. I mean, I covered some of this in sort of jump the gun a little bit, so apologies. Um, so yeah, I, I can't see how you could manage this um, credibly on a personal level. And by the way, I suspect that most senior managers on this call think would right, be right in concluding they've got way better things to do than personally manage the individual knowledge and competence of every person on their team. And some of these spans of controls are massive. Um, I would say um, I, I, I have nothing uh, commercially to gain from this but if you haven't read the book uh, the fourth education revolution by anthony seldom you need to go and buy it and read it it's um it's really interesting and to some extent it really does challenge all aspects of education and it resonates enormously with what all of you are facing in the financial services marketplace over the next decade so go buy it so when it comes to strengthening culture and improving compliance and delivering better customer outcomes, um, senior managers need to know what good looks like. When it comes yeah, to I mean, there is that, I mean, caveat, I would say this, given what we do for a living, but even if you take my bias, to use a trendy word, out of the um, equation, there are some fundamental components to modern, and read the book by Seldon, right? There are some fundamental uh, truths, truths associated with wanting to get uh, employees to engage with a subject matter. But let's be completely honest, few view as exciting. And you may or may not know, but if your brain codifies something as boring, it becomes even more difficult to learn and retain. And I suspect, whilst many of your employees recognise that compliance and governance process they're important i'd be really surprised how many codify it as something other than boring but to to, to, to overcome this one of the critical success factors is your you, you must treat your employees as an individual yeah you, you have to respect expertise where it exists and uh, provide support and assistance uh, uh, in the flow of work i've said here um to those that require it and what that means is the traditional approach of right down tools get, get 
do your do your e-learning module now get back on with your work it, i mean to be honest this this is this is long dead it's inappropriate long dead and doesn't work um it doesn't treat your employees with respect and will not underpin a culture where your firm genuinely treats customers fairly um Equally, single point in time assessment is largely useless. Um, if you mathematically review that, you would say that at any one point in time, half outstanding, is accurate as of six months ago. So I would not like to rely on data that was accurate six months ago in the event of some sort of compliance failure on behalf of my business in a span of control that might span thousands of people. So the answer to the question is continual assessment. Continual assessment needs to be bundled with continual repair so and should in our opinion provide risk leaders CROs for the first time with forward-facing risk radar arising from their employee base now you know you're all very well shutting the door after the horse has bolted but as a, a, an ex-senior manager I would have loved at the time to have forward-facing radar that says to me it, there is a there is a problem it's systemic and it's in this area so that I can then go and fix it and finally evidence you've got to evidence it um, you've got to be able to provide evidence and I know and our customers know the comfort that continual assessment provides versus single point in time assessment provides uh, uh, not to mention it it's incredible nine nine out of ten employees prefer it to the to the traditional approach. Yeah, all too often, Adrian, we've seen in the marketplace that um, senior managers crying out for the MI that they want, but also the MI that they need to make risk decisions over conduct and culture. And they need that MI in front of them to evaluate those risks to their business so that they can achieve the business objectives that Brogan has said that you want to put in your submissions uh, for authorization or ongoing authorizations to maintain that authorization. You don't yeah. want those risk, you want to demonstrate to the regulator a clean pair of heels that says, right, I've got robust risk controls for my biggest risk, which is my people. I've just said it. Well done. I was going to say uh, the irony in a digital world is that perhaps one of your greatest single threats and greatest single uh, control or parts of your governance structure is your employee base. Get that right. And it's fantastic. Most firms couldn't tell you the level of competency inherent in that group. And actually, if you're really serious about it, your first line, your employees, if they know their stuff, yeah, that's probably perhaps your greatest governance leader. Okay, we've got a number of questions that have been posted. So if we can just post the last poll question, if you want to obviously reach out to Brogan and also Adrian um, um, after this webinar, and I, I do believe Jonathan is going to provide the slide deck to, um, to organisations and also provide an opportunity um, for you to reach out um, to get the, the forthcoming checklist. So please do email him directly on that. I'm sure you'll provide the details. Yes, I'm going to put my details in um, in the chat function in a moment. Um, so people can just copy and paste my details there. And I'll also um, touch on what our free giveaway um, is today after we go through a couple of the questions we've got time for a couple of them um we'll just wait till this poll give the poll another couple of moments um and then we'll uh, we'll move on to the questions i'm just conscious of the time it looks like we've got a couple of minutes let me see if i can bring them up at the moment whilst the poll's still running at the same time um so uh, as a first question um, is the procedure of establishing a branch in the UK different to establishing a subsidiary? Uh, Brogan, I think this might be one for you. Brogan? I think you might be on mute. No, we can't, can't hear you just yet. So um, let's move on to a question potentially for, for Adrian here. Um, please explain more about certification of employees. Are there any special exams in the UK that need to be passed? Philip, maybe as well, you have any uh, insight into this one? Um, well, it depends on the role and function of the individual um, for a start and, it, um, and also what they are and um, what you, they are, <coughs> what 
firm's function is as well as the role of the individual there. So without knowing further details, one will be able to comment on, on that one there. Okay, fantastic. Um, Brogan, can you hear us? I think so. Can you hear me? Yes, can hear you now. Great, thank so you. So in, in, I'll reread the question out again. Um, I'm conscious of time, so this will probably be the, the only other question, sure. but we have kept a note of all other questions that have been asked today, and we'll be emailing each person individually um, with, a, with a response to them. So the question is, is the procedure to establish a branch in the UK different to that of a subsidiary? Uh, so in relation to TPR firms that applying for authorisation, um, the application process uh, is the same with regards to the Connect system, which is where it will be carried out. But uh, the differences between branch and subsidiary are quite different. So a branch is the same legal entity as the head office, um, whereas a separate legal entity is a subsidiary from the parent. Um, so therefore, authorization of a branch applies to the whole entity, whereas authorization for a subsidiary only applies to that subsidiary. So there are slightly different requirements for each. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Brogan. Um, so unfortunately, we've actually come to the, um, the allotted time for this webinar today. So as I said before, any and all questions will be um, emailed to the individuals who ask them. Um, and if you have any further questions off the back of this, I have posted my email address into the chat function here. So you can copy and paste it and email me details. Um, I'll come on to the, the free giveaway in a second, but before I do, I just want to let everyone know that Complyport's running a promotion on our authorization support services. And as this is our 20th anniversary year, we're offering the first 20 firms who sign up with us for authorization support a significantly reduced fee. So if you wanted to inquire into it, please send me an email, um, as mentioned before, where my ad email address is. Now, in terms of the um, free giveaway today, we are offering a step-by-step -step authorization guide. Um, if you would like to get hold of this, please can you email me um, and request it, and we can send you a copy of it there afterwards, along with a copy of the slides as well. Uh, a couple of people have asked, is this going to be recorded? Yes, this is going to be recorded today. Um, so if you would like to see the recording, if you can please uh, follow um, ComplyPort and Elephants Don't Forget on LinkedIn, we'll be publishing the recording on there um, quite soon. I'd like to thank all of the attendees uh, for joining us in today's webinar. Um, I'd also like to thank Brogan, Adrian, and Philip for your time today. Um, again, another is another partner of ours, J7 Communications. They helped us significantly in promoting this event. So um, very much like to thank them as well. Um, thank you for everyone attending and have a very good day. Thanks very much, Jonathan. Thank you, Brogan. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Thanks very much.